Ohio State, of course. Uh, Urban Meyer, let's see, he lost nine games in seven seasons, but uh, so each one's amplified in regards to what it cost the Buckeyes, and one of the ones that stands out is the first time that uh, Ohio State will take on Iowa since that uh, dark day in Iowa City in 2017, the 55 game. We got Corey Brad on the line from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Ohio State and Iowa get together in October, this time in Columbus, Corey. Appreciate you being here. Oh, you are muted. Now you're good. I no. I'm I'm good now. Go. I just want to say, uh, first of all, I'm glad that Steve let us know that Ohio State is talented from top to bottom because no one would have known that had he not said it. So thank you, yeah, Steve. I'm the master of the obvious. <laughs> for letting us know that Ohio State's got talent from top to bottom. But no, uh, that's going to be the storyline. I mentioned this to Mark uh, a couple of days ago that – uh, if I'm Ohio State, and I, and you guys can give perspective on this that I cannot, uh, but if I'm looking at this through an Ohio State lens, um, I am absolutely, uh, if I'm Ryan Day, using that 2017 game as motivation. Because a normal, t- like, look, if uh, Iowa beats Purdue, right, by 30 points, uh, Purdue's going to get up for Iowa every year, right? They're, they're divisional rivals. I mean, obviously, Iowa's actually been more successful in the West than Purdue. So Ohio state, I would think you need to, uh, obviously if you have your, your team locked in and ready every week, that's great. But a team of Ohio state's talent and firepower, one would think that uh, any extra motivation is helpful. Am I wrong on that? I would think you'd put that 2017 score on the, on the Bolton board. I think the one thing that kind of works counter to that is there may only be five guys six guys on the entire team that would have been on the team, you know, with the super senior year back to that, maybe not even five. I don't know who all we're talking about, but uh, I mean, they've heard about it and I'm sure, you know, maybe one or two of them were there. Um, Even, even if those guys got to travel as true freshmen, who knows? But um, I think today's athlete is kind of hard to motivate, with something that's happened to other athletes. I think it it has to happen to them for them to have any, any knowledge of it, any recollection of it. They are just so tunnel focused on what's going on in their lives. They would have been in high school more than likely at that point. And so, yeah, it sticks out like a sore thumb, no doubt. I mean, it's the, the worst beating Ohio state's taken, you know, one of the worst beatings in recent memory, but um, you know, I think, um, just I think if you put the tape in and watch week in and week out what Iowa does to people, particularly with its defense, just how fundamentally sound they are, how they don't typically beat themselves, those kind of things. I know there were a couple outliers last year with you know Michigan, et cetera, but um, I think that's going to catch their attention probably more than in something from six, well, it'll be five years ago now, I guess. But, uh, you know, I, Again, Iowa and Ohio State typically play really good games. I mean, it, they do. It, even yeah. in Columbus, Ohio State has struggled to beat beat Iowa any number of times. I can't recall the last time Iowa won in Columbus. Maybe it was 91 or 92, something like that. I, I could be wrong. 87. But, uh, 87. But, I mean, we're talking 2000. Well, the, 2009, the, it goes to overtime. I mean, 2000, the Terrell Pryor yeah. year, I know, was was close for a time. time. 91, and that was the game where they lost 16 to 9, and there had been a shooting on the Iowa campus, I think, and they, they went out and won, hmm. yeah, won that game uh, in honor of the people, uh, you know, back in Iowa. And Ohio State was just shell shocked, you know, that day themselves. But um, I don't know. Uh, it 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 it's an important game, I think. And it's one that Ohio State can't afford to overlook and just assume that at Ohio Stadium they can throw the helmets out there and beat them because Iowa, you know, can beat anybody on any given week or they could be made to look really bad by anybody in any given week. It just kind of depends, you know, how how things are rolling for them in that part. If they're able to establish the run and stop the run, then they're in every game. I mean, that's just the way it is. Yeah, the that 2017 team, there are three guys still remaining, Jerron Cage, Bradley Robinson, a long snapper, 
and Mitch Rossi, fullback, tight end. And I don't know that any of them would have made the trip. I think this is more of a – it's used as a cautionary tale. I definitely believe the game gets will be talked about and that loss will be discussed, but as a cautionary tale in terms of you, you can't just show up and do this. And especially against an Iowa defense that is always solid, I think this gets talked about as perhaps a, a preview of a possible Big Ten championship game preview. And so I don't see this being any sort of um, roadblock or speed bump. I think Ohio State will be very serious about this, and and they need to be because if they start thinking they don't need to be, then you oh let's show you some more highlights of the two, 2017 game again and and how you how you feel about that one. And uh, you know I think as long as the 2022 team defends the Iowa tight ends, I think they'll be okay. <laughs> Nobody a, had told. Greg Schiano that the tight end was a uh, eligible receiver before that 20, that, you know, for that night only, he he's like, I didn't know. I didn't know that. So, yeah. You look at, you look at the stats from last year and what, la- what last year was compared to what this next year is, you know, you can, you can't necessarily just pour everything over, you know, 121 in the nation in total offense, 101 in rushing offense, 109 in passing offense. I think I think the big question is going to be where you know where is the improvement going to be because you know Iowa you're always still going to be looking at total defense they were 17th in the nation they were 13 against the run you know you're going to be in for a tough day in terms of what your offense is but it comes down to what is Iowa going to be able to do offensively and you know to kind of get back to what what Steve and Tony were joking about there Ohio State just seemed to not understand that the tight end was actually a position that was on the football field the last time that these teams went at it. Uh, you know, where, where is it going to come in? Where's it going to come from for Iowa? And I know that, you know, we're, it's a lot of just speculation here in July, but you know, I think that's what it comes down to. Corey, I want to ask you this question <clears throat> as somebody who covers the West. The West is 0-8, I believe, is the number against the East in the Big Ten championship game. And we see the ACC is scrapping the divisions. There's two schools of thought on this. And just curious what people in the Western footprint of the Big Ten think. If they scrap the divisions, then the top two teams play each other for the championship, which I think there's some trepidation in the East, and particularly with Ohio State, that if they beat Michigan one week and then have to turn around and play them again as the number two team the following week, is that a good thing, or, you know, the potential if you scrap the divisions is instead of playing, you know, the number three team in the country out of the East against the number 15 champion from the West, you could have three versus six, you know, in the championship game, uh, maybe a tougher championship game for the team coming out of the East. And yet the schools in the West keep butting their heads against, you know, the glass ceiling in the East. Is it better to have access to the game, even though you haven't, I say you, even though the Western teams haven't won it, or would it be better to scrap divisions and just have the league's two best teams play? What do the people in the West think about that? Well, I mean, I know from an Iowa perspective, I think scrapping divisions, which I'm hopeful that the realignment and and whether we're done for now or not, I'm hopeful that means we're not scrapping divisions. Uh, You know, I don't don't know that for certain. I just can't imagine going to to a situation where you've got literally 16 teams competing in one conference and then just taking the top two. But, you know, when you have, you're not able to play everybody, it makes less and less sense, right? I mean, the big 12 had um, a true, they, they've had a true conference champion because everybody's played each other. Um, so I, I would say from an Iowa perspective, I, I'm very clear on this. Um, I hate the idea of scrapping divisions because Iowa has struggled to win the West Um as it was and get to the big 10 championship as it was. And so now you're talking about having to yeah, beat out Ohio state, Penn state, Michigan, Michigan state, plus all those schools they've struggled with. They've struggled to beat out Northwestern. They struggled to beat Wisconsin. They've lost to Purdue. I think four of the last five meetings. So mm. no, there's no question about it. Divi- scrapping divisions does not help Iowa, uh, Iowa's case. Now, Mark, you may have some perspective on this better than I do. Am I wrong in saying that that realignment realignment helps Iowa's cause from a division standpoint, I would think that would only create discussions for maintaining divisions or at least redistributing divisions. You come up with some different ideas as possible divisions if Oregon and Washington end up joining the conference, which I know there's varying reports out there, but I I would think that realignment helps Iowa's cause. 
Well, yeah, if we look at the eight previous championship games, had it been a one versus two seeding, then the East yeah. winner would have always made the championship game, and half of those eight would have been supplanted with another Eastern Division team. Now, let me just say this. Uh, I believe it was Tony that brought this up earlier. So it sounds like Ohio State's got a few guys carried over from the 17 roster. Uh, before I jumped on here, I just scrolled through Iowa's roster, and I'm pretty sure I'm accurate on this. I was not comparing, but the only name, that I could see that was a carryover. One guy. Does anybody want to take a guess as to who it is? Because it is a notable name. You guys may not get it. Mark May. Anybody want to take a guess as to who it is that, that is still on the Iowa roster? Does Kirk Ferentz have another son who plays or something? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, that, that's a good, that's a good guess. But... No, it's uh, uh, it's Tony or, excuse, Tony Rassiopi. No, it's uh, Nico Regani, Iowa receiver. Nico Regani, who very well could end up being Iowa's number one receiver this year. He should be because he's by far Iowa's most veteran receiver. So um, you're right. I, I think that the point can easily be made that uh, when you don't have guys carried over from a previous loss like that 2017 loss, that perhaps it doesn't, it's not as relevant. But I do think just from a uh, pride stand, a school's pride standpoint, that that game can still be used. Um, I'd love to see Kirk Ferentz put Nico Regani in the front of the room and, and tell those guys what it was like to beat Ohio State in 2017 because that's one of the best memories for Iowa fans of the past decade, and I don't think that's exaggerating. Um, Iowa fans think uh, fonder of that game than uh, certainly the the 2015 Big Ten Championship game, although they were a play or two away from uh, making it to the playoffs. So um, certainly that, o- that Ohio State game from an Iowa perspective should absolutely be revisited. Brian Ferentz needs to watch tape from that game and say, okay, what the heck did we do? Because that was by far Brian Ferentz's best called game. And yeah, I don't know what, I'm not quite sure what the Ohio State game plan going into that game was. If I recall, the Buckeyes were coming off a really uh, exhausting, emotional game against Penn State. Am I correct in saying that in 2017? So, you know, I don't know how much, but Iowa completely made, and it started from the first play. Uh, R.J. Barrett struggled from the very first play of the game and it's just easy when you're on the road and you're, you know, it's a packed house and you're going to show out for a team like Ohio State. It's easy for those kinds of things to snowball. You get a pick six from Moani Hooker early. Uh, you've got two of the best. I mean, that's as far as a tight end duo, has Iowa ever had a better tight end duo than Noah Fant and TJ Hawkins? And I don't think they have. And those guys showed out in that game. Nate Stanley was a tough son of a gun, um, as uh, Ohio State's defensive line uh, proved. And let's not forget um, Watt. Uh, didn't he or not Watt? Uh, Watts, Wisconsin. Who's the kid that got kicked out of that game? Bosa. I was going to say there were two two things. As long as a Bosa doesn't get ejected Bosa. There you go. and that they don't run JT Barrett 55 times or whatever it was, I think I like Ohio State's chances. And, and, and I mean, so if you look at compile all of that, Iowa gets a pick, pick six, the first play of the game. All right. You get three, you get a hat trick from Josh Jackson in the defensive backfield. You get three picks from Josh Jackson, one circus pick on the goal line that was a la Odell Beckham style. Uh, And uh, again, the tight ends, um, Iowa had a lot go its way in that game. And that's why you're going to get 55, put up 55 points against Ohio state. I will say this as bad as Iowa's offense has been. And it, I'm not projecting it to be, I don't know. You know, you hope that it can get in the top hundred. Ohio State's defense wasn't good last year either. I think they were around 60th. Now, that's much better in comparison to Iowa's offense, no question about it. But who will make the jump? Obviously, from a talent standpoint, one would think that Ohio State is in line for a bigger jump on that side of the ball. Uh, It's not like Ohio State lacks talent. So um, I hope Brian Ferentz revisits that tape because the way he called that game, the way he called the Holiday Bowl against uh, USC a couple of years later, that's how he's got to call a game like this. you got to go balls to the walls and just say, look, <laughs> it's do or die. You cannot go into a game the way Iowa went into the Purdue game at home last year, the way they went into the Big Ten Championship game against Michigan, the way they went on the road at Madison last year. They go into that game against Wisconsin that same way every single year where you just bang your head against a wall and you say, well, we're going to do what we're going to do, and by God, it's going to work. And then it never works. So – cannot do that against Ohio State and it seems like Brian again going back to the 17 game it seems like Brian Ferentz understands that let's hope it carries over to this year if you're an Iowa fan I think one difference I have with Ohio State's defense compared to Iowa's offense is Ryan Day fired the defensive coordinator and changed defensive coordinators Iowa having a lackluster offense promoted it's not a bug it's a feature basically and and this is something I've 
I've come up with uh, that I've subscribed to since the nineties with Northwestern's offense and Purdue's offense and also covering Jim Trestle's offense. If you have a bad offense in, in college football, it's by choice because there are a number of things you can do to have a good offense. Even if you don't have the most talent, look what Northwestern was able to do. Look what Joe Tiller did with Purdue. Like you can do some things in the spread and Iowa, just like Ohio state back in the day with Jim Trestle, very conservative and that's by choice. And so I, I don't know that uh, I was ever going to have the offense that is needed, which leads me to a question here as we're trying to wrap up. I'm sure all of this money that's coming into the Big Ten, will there be any teams, any schools, any programs that are able to use that and become a national title contender? Can Iowa do that? Can Wisconsin? Can Purdue? Can any of these teams from the West or even – Michigan and Penn State, I don't think they can with their current coaches. Does it create any new championship contenders, national championship contenders? Well, Tony, Tony, I don't want to be set off on my soapbox, but Iowa, it's not like Iowa doesn't have the funds to make changes to make this offense a lot better. Kirk Ferentz decided Mm -hmm. to promote Brian Ferentz to quarterbacks coach following a year where the offense was 123rd in the country. He decided to not fire his son. Nobody expects him to fire his son, right? That's the problem with nepotism. That's the issue with it. But he decided to promote Kirk, uh, Brian Ferentz to quarterbacks coach, a position he's never coached, a position he's never played, and he has no understanding of it. He admitted in the spring he doesn't know how to throw a football. So I'm in no way implying that Iowa is going to be making some big jump offensively. But my point is, Ken O'Keefe, who was Iowa's quarterbacks coach prior to the promotion for Brian, steps away. He was, he was the highest, Tony, he was the highest paid QBs coach in the country. In the country. Think about that, fellas. I was, I'm going to repeat it again. I was quarterback's coach who was, that was his only job, right? Ken O'Keefe's a former offensive coordinator, worked with the wide receivers down with the Dolphins for years. He was the highest paid quarterback's coach in the country, not not being a coordinator. So um, the decision was when he stepped away to promote Brian Ferentz. So it's doubling down, tripling down, quadrupling down. And so I don't have faith. They could have went a lot of places with that 700000 a year that they were paying Ken O'Keefe. They could have went a ton of places and found a viable QBs coach. Mark and I have talked about it. Randy Hedberg is one up at North Dakota State who I have know was interested in the job, and Iowa didn't even entertain it. He's produced Trey Lance, Carson Wentz, uh, Easton Stick. It's a perfect example. And I'm sure there would have been plenty of other candidates. Who wouldn't want to coach a team that is a perennial contender for a, a – Big 10 division, whether it's the weaker of the two divisions or not, the defense, I mean, you know, you're talking about working on the other side of the ball to one of the best coordinators in the country and Phil Parker. I don't think there's much to debate on that. So I, I, the answer to your question, Tony is sure. I think there's lots of things Iowa could do to become a contender. That's why Iowa people, uh, including myself have been frustrated because I don't even think it's been a matter of, well, they, they, they just have a lack of funding. They need a bit more funding to be able to, to pay a great coordinator to come here. I just think the choice has been Kirk Ferentz is in the phase of his career where he's comfortable, he's safe, and he's decided to double down. Now, maybe it will work. I hope it does. And I have nothing against Kirk or Brian personally, but that's that's just the fact. And I think there are other teams that could benefit, and that would certainly hurt Iowa's chances. Well, it worked for Bobby Bowden to let his sons run his offense into the ground. Yeah. Well, it worked for Bill Snyder, right, too. So you can go down the list. Nepotism. I mean, that's why there's there's, there's rules against. Knight. What's that? I said it's just not football. Look at Pat Knight. He did such a great job, you know, under under Bobby. Yeah, there there. That's why there's rules on nepotism. And uh, I brought this up too. Chuck Long went on the radio. I mean, the greatest quarterback to ever play at Iowa, and flat out called it nepotism. That's not a good look. But again, when you have as much power as you, and I I I say it. I've said it a million times. Mark knows this. I have tons of respect for Kirk Ferentz. I think he's a great human being. I think he's an outstanding man. However. Blood's thicker than water, and I think he. I, I get it. That's why it's hard when you put yourself in that position. There's no looking back once you hire your son. And this is what I don't understand because the same thing happened in Miami with Mark Richt. He had a great opportunity. He comes back to his alma mater. He brings in the eighth best recruiting class in the country. He gets them to their best season in years, but he elevates his son to a position he didn't earn. When you've got that kind of weight, when you're Kirk Ferentz or Mark Rick, you can get your son all sorts of jobs across the country. I would set up my son with a great job. You'd go be the offensive coordinator at Idaho or somewhere. 
uh, you know, make the phone call, but don't ruin my job. <laughs> well, again, to, to wrap up my side of this, Mark, uh, Brian Ferentz, who has been promoted, I think unfairly, but he's been promoted, does have that 2017 game to hang his hat on. And as I think it was uh, Steve brought it up earlier, Iowa has competed with Ohio State well in the, during the course of Kirk Ferentz's career. Honestly, if I looked back, um, they probably competed better with Ohio State than they have with Wisconsin, um, perhaps better than they have at times against Michigan State. I, I recall a lot of pretty tight games uh, against some pretty good Ohio State game, uh, teams. Uh, I'm trying to think of the Braxton Miller year. That game was close for a while, if I'm not mistaken. I know Iowa had a deep ball to tight end Jake Doozy down the sideline that kind of got him back. It, and I just remember – Urban, now this is a different coaching staff too, to some extent. I know Day was on that staff, right, in 2017, but um, it is it is different. There has been a lot of change on both sides of the ball, no question. 